and welcome to our weekly webinar. Today's webinar is brought to you by Digital Systems KTN and Amazon. We have uh, 14 people with us. We will just wait for another min one minute or so before we start the actual webinar. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Today we have uh, Matt Wood from Amazon Web Services with us. Um, before I introduce him, I just would like to cover a few standard uh, things about this webinar platform. We are using gotomeeting.com, a third party application for rendering this webinar. All participants are on mute. If you have any question to ask, please type them in using the questions tab. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you want to draw attention, please use the raise hand option. You can also use this raise hand option during the question and answer if you want me to unmute you so that you can ask the question yourself. Matt Wood is a technology evangelist for Europe from Amazon Web Services. Before joining Amazon, Matt built web scale search engines at Cornell University, some document management systems in Cambridge University, and he also helped Welcome Trust Sanger Institute to build a petabyte scale DNA sequencing platform. Matt has a PhD in bioinformatics and other interesting hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know about them later on. He's helping out uh, businesses to build highly available products and services that have many advantages such as agility, scalability, security, and so on, so on. Today, Matt will be speaking about Amazon Web Services and how the best practices will bring agility into business. Over to you, Matt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's good. Um, so, uh, hello everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Wood, uh, thanks for that uh, great introduction. Uh, I'm the technology evangelist uh, for Amazon Web Services here in Europe. Uh, I take care of Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Africa as well. Uh, and it's my responsibility and my privilege to uh, travel around uh, the region uh, talking to smart people such as yourselves uh, about cloud computing. Uh, about half of what I do uh, is, uh, is talk to people about the cloud, answer questions about the cloud, uh, specifically uh, Amazon's um, cloud computing platform. Uh, and the other half is simply to take your questions uh, and use your feedback to roll into our, into our, roadmap, into our roadmap for the platform uh, as it matures. Uh, so hello, thank you for joining me. Um, today I'd just like to talk about uh, three things. 
I was going to talk about for, for probably about 20 minutes about just three things. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about are, are building blocks. Um, so for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, Amazon Web Services uh, provides infrastructure services. So these are high-scale, flexible tools for building complex, highly available, flexible um, computer systems. Um, Matt, um, Matt, sorry hi. to interrupt you. Uh, the screen uh, is is uh, not showing anything. Could you please okay. relaunch okay. your presentation? Okay, here we go. Let me try again. Ah, yeah. Now it's sorry. better. Yeah. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go on. Oh, thank you. No. If, if there are any other problems, please do just interrupt me. Um, so uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, provides uh, infrastructure services. So these are sort of computational building blocks uh, for highly available computer systems. Uh, and I think uh, it's a reasonable question, and I get asked it quite a lot. Um, what is a bookstore uh, doing selling highly scalable infrastructure services? Um, so I wanted to just cover a little bit about the background about where Amazon Web Services came from, uh, why we operate in this way, uh, and why Amazon, uh, obviously well known for selling products uh, and e-commerce uh, on the internet, uh, provides these services at all. Um, so uh, it all started about 15 years ago. Uh, Amazon.com started up in the US. Uh, it actually started up in our CEO's, um, his parents' garage, uh, so the Bezos family garage. Uh, and it initially ran on just two servers. The website ran on two servers. They just had an application server and a database server. Uh, in the first, uh, first week of operation of Amazon.com, they had orders from all 50 states. Uh, and it became clear that obviously there were going to be some successful. Uh, the infrastructure grew, became more complex, it was globally distributed. Uh, everything you'd expect from a, from a high capacity um, e-commerce site such as uh, Amazon. And as Amazon started to mature as a company and started to move into selling other products uh, such as uh, DVDs, Blu-ray, DVD players, uh, pet food, uh, you name it. Um, what they noticed internally was that each of the product teams that were developing new sites, new areas, be it selling games uh, or surfboards, um, they all had to reinvent the wheel when it came to uh, working at scale. There's a lot of heavy lifting involved in producing new services, new products around provisioning infrastructure. So be it servers to serve the website, back-end computational uh, work, um, storage, uh, image distribution, things like this. There was a lot of work in setting these things up, and each of the teams that was working had to reinvent the wheel uh, when they were getting up and running. Uh, now, Amazon is a very uh, service-oriented company. Uh, everything from the recommendation engine to the accounting system is all web service-driven internally. Uh, in fact, when you visit Amazon.co.uk, you're actually visiting about 150 uh, internal web services just to build the front page. And so Amazon very much took the service approach and applied it to the data center. And uh, so um, in just the same way that you could provision and request uh, other resources, uh, so Amazon took the same service-oriented approach to provision and request infrastructure. And the basic goal was to take care of this undifferentiated heavy lifting of working with uh, high-volume, uh, fault-tolerant applications. Um, back then, uh, it wasn't called the cloud or anything like that. Uh, this was just uh, a, a service offering, a web service, which allowed teams to be more productive and work more productively by taking care of this undifferentiated heavy lifting. After all, uh, this wasn't the team's core competency. Uh, provisioning servers, installing servers, uh, wasn't the core competency. They just wanted to move quickly, innovate quickly, and move to market in as short a time as possible. Uh, so this service-oriented approach was taken. Uh, this is not excess capacity uh, left over from Christmas or anything like that. This is a well-funded, uh, global, highly optimized operational company, uh, which is growing just as quickly as possible. And we now offer exactly the same web services for taking care of this undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, for computer services as was, ma was made available to the internal um, teams inside Amazon. Uh, we very much see our own garbage. Uh, Amazon.com is still built around these, these services. We have a pretty broad range of services, um, and uh, they all have some similar core um, characteristics. The first is that they're all available on demand. Uh, this means that you don't need to uh, ask us ahead of schedule um, what uh, you want to provision, how many servers you need, or how much storage you need. There's no contract negotiations or upfront payments. Uh, you can just sign up on our website, as I'll show you in a minute, 
and uh, get started. Uh, everything is on demand. Uh, you request it, and we make it available to you as and when you need it. <coughs> the second characteristic is that everything is available on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, and moreover, uh, you only pay for what you use. So what this means is that you don't start paying for, say, storage until you write the first A of data into our storage service. Uh, and you, you stop paying for it when you delete that final uh, K of data. There are no subscription costs or ongoing payments if you're not using the services. And the more you use of a service, uh, the more you pay. Uh, and conversely, the less you use of a service, the less you pay. Uh, so we charge uh, per gigabyte per month or part thereof for storage. Uh, and per CPU, or the equivalent of the CPU, uh, per hour for our service. Uh, then there's, um, there's a little bit of bandwidth and all the rest of it, but all of that still available uh, on a pay for what you use and pay as you go basis. Matt, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Uh, the, screen, uh, the screen we are seeing is only infrastructure as a service. Oh, right, OK. okay. So it was stuck at can that. you see that? Yes, okay. we are seeing elastic capacity. Okay, I'll tell you what, if I just, yeah. would it be easier if I, uh, if I just go through my list? You seem to be having some technical issues on the Mac here. Uh, okay, are they changing now? Oh, yes. Okay, great. Okay, I'll stick to this. Um, if you can ignore this uh, control panel, and, uh, and we'll see how we get on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I talked about... Um, just going back, I talked about uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. I talked about our services being available on demand, uh, being available on a pay-as-you-go basis, and only paying for what you use. Uh, so you didn't miss too much on the slide there. What I'd like to talk about quickly now is elastic capacity uh, and capacity planning for services. Uh, so we have full elastic capacity uh, for things like storage, uh, for middleware, for servers. Uh, and for anyone that's ever had to plan uh, the capacity of a particular service, be it for storage or the number of servers that you need, um, you typically end up with a, with a graph of something like this. We have capacity uh, up, uh, along one side, time along the bottom, and you try and plan uh, the estimated demand of your service, and hopefully that's going to go up. Uh, and based on that estimated demand, um, you build out your capacity. So the green line here represents the infrastructure uh, for your, required for your service, and it typically takes this saw-proof, sawtooth sort of uh, characteristic. Uh, that is that uh, you have a certain amount of capacity, uh, it's completely flat, uh, and then when you want to increase that, you pay a lot amount of money, so this is upfront capital expenditure. Uh, you increase your capacity uh, with some investments by increasing the amount of infrastructure available to you, uh, and you try and map against this estimated demand. Now, that's all very well and good. Uh, the real problem is that real demand typically doesn't use, look anything like this estimation. Uh, it goes up as well as down. And um, here you've got a real problem if you've got this sort of traditional, statically provisioned uh, capital expenditure model of, of buying in new infrastructure to, to try and keep up with demand. Um, over on the left-hand side of the graph here, you can see we've got a gap between uh, where our demand sits in terms of capacity uh, and where our infrastructure is. So this is uh, effectively wasted expenditure. Uh, this is uh, servers that are sat there spinning, uh, but not serving any customers. This is storage, which is sat there, uh, which you have to maintain, cool, uh, power, and all the rest of it, um, but which isn't being used. Uh, this, is, this is wasted uh, capacity spend. Um, at the other end of the graph, of course, uh, we have the situation where demand has outstripped uh, capacity. And this is really an, op uh, an opportunity cost uh, for your company, for your business. This is demand which can 